is a youth-led movement founded by the Youth Committee of FAO, and it's a network of partners that work together to transform our agri-food systems and achieve the sustainable development goals, especially SDG2 Zero Hunger. I want to welcome you all to the first Young Scientific Roundtable organized to promote the transformative research challenge of the World Food Forum. We will talk more about the challenge at the end of the event, and I am extremely happy and honored to host this very important event today and welcome such a broad audience from all around the world. I see the numbers are fast increasing. We have already 58 participants and I will invite Paola perhaps to share the results of the poll to see where you, where you guys are joining from. Wow, okay. So I see the most part comes from Asia and the Pacific. I'm sure most of you, many will, will be joining a bit later from other regions, but we do have an international representation from all the regions today. Very happy to have you. And again, warm work, welcome. Your interest and presence here today really prove the crucial and active role that youth is playing to face the challenges that the world has today. And it is also the proof that youth has the potential to transform our agri-food systems and end hunger. So before moving on, let me quickly introduce myself. Connecting from Rome, my name is Carolina Pulido Ariza. I am a marketing and outreach specialist at FAO and the co-lead of the World Food Forum's innovation track. I will be your moderator today, leading you jointly with our World Food Forum team on what we hope will be a very different digital event. Because let's face it, we are all fatigued from webinars. So today is all about participation. Please write where you're coming from, add your comments and questions, we are reading you. I'd also like to thank our partners for, this, uh, for making all of this event possible, FAO, CGIR, A5, and One Planet Solutions. We have gathered a youthful and brilliant panel that throughout this hour session will illustrate the role of youth in science to achieve the SDGs. So going through the agenda today, I will ask my team to please share the agenda. Uh, we will start uh, with a fantastic presentation. Uh, we are very honored to have Maximo Torero, FAO Chief Economist amongst us to kick off this session. Uh, he will share with us his views on the crucial role of youth in science to rebuild a better new normal. I will give him the floor in just a minute. After his speech, we will have five youthful scientists from CGIR and A5 introduce themselves and go into details about their research expertise. And this will be followed by an open dialogue between panelists and a Q&A session. So please keep your questions coming. And now, without further ado, it is my pleasure to introduce Maximo Torero, FAO Chief Economist. Maximo Torero, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you very much. And thank you very much all for, for being here. Uh, it's a real pleasure uh, for me to, to be part of this meeting and to be part of, of this youth committee. Uh, I am the FAO chief scientist, uh, but I am also a researcher and I have been doing research since I was young as you. Uh, but also I am a firm believer of scientific research and evidence-based research. And I think is the only way we can able to catalyze and to do the transformation that, that we need to do today and to change the way we are working in the agricultural food systems. This is why I am very happy with a conversation of a panel of young and talented researchers from around the world. Uh, and they are a perfect example of how youth and science have the potential to end hunger. And I will explain a little bit more on that. Uh, my intervention today will provide an update of the situation and the challenges we are living uh, in the agri-food systems and the key role that we believe uh, youth can do and, and how them working with science can make a, a big difference. As you all know, uh, COVID-19 just is a pandemic that exacerbates a situation that was already there. Uh, the world we were living uh, already was facing enormous amount of challenges. We have significant levels of undernourishment that, that although uh, since 2014, it started to increase a little bit, it was never on track and on path to be able to achieve SDG2. And we have last year 690 million people at the level of undernourishment. This is chronic undernourishment. And what COVID-19 did is increase this number and could increase this number up to 132 million more of chronic undernourished people. 
At the same time, uh, because of COVID-19, the level of emergencies uh, has exacerbated and emergencies normally are triggered because of climate shocks, uh, because of conflict and because of recessions, slowdown, downturns. And COVID-19 has accelerated the impact of recessions. But also for the areas where we already had conflict and where we already have climate shocks, it exacerbated the situation. And if we look at the indicator uh, of the level of acute food insecure, which is different to chronic undernourishment, which is more a long-term, acute food insecurity is a, is a short-term effect because of a significant shock. We are now in 155 million people which are facing acute food insecurity. So the numbers are enormous and we are very far from achieving SDG2. And that's something that we need to change. And it's not only SDG2, it's also SDG1, zero poverty and SDG10 inequalities, which we normally forget about inequalities, which are so central. And if you look around the world and look at countries, there is very little policy, serious policies and evidence on how to reduce inequalities. Now, all this is happening in a world where we have restrictions in access to land, quality of land. We have re access, restrictions in access to water. We have climate change because of emissions and the agricultural food systems is an important player in terms of greenhouse gas emissions. And also we have enormous amount of, of conflict, but we have to feed uh, the population. Now, if we are mechanistic and we add all the food that is produced today in the world, mechanistically, we will have enough calories to feed everybody in the world. If we even move into flexitarian diets, which is the Lancet diet, which is not the diets, the healthy diets, but at, at least it's one of the elements based on vegetables, uh, we will have enough, basically enough with what produced today to do that. But despite this, today we have 3 billion people that don't have access to healthy diets, to the minimum cost healthy diet. So the problem is not just more production or more productivity, the problem is also distribution. It's how we distribute this food around the world so that people uh, and rural people and poor people and urban, peri-urban people can have access so that we don't have these 3 billion people uh, facing uh, this type of a challenge. And also in a world where at the same time, 14% in average around the world of the food is being lost and 70% is being wasted. So FAO used to say one third, but, but those are the new numbers. Now the problem is, does this make any sense? How, how we can change this thing? And that's where we are working very hard uh, and trying to create this transformation of the agri-food systems. And we call it agri-food systems because the production in the world, the agricultural production, part of it is not for food, like fibers, biofuels, cotton, for example. And another part, most of it is produced for food, for staples, high value commodities, livestock, meat, and so on. But there is also a little piece that is out of the agricultural world, which is basically what we are seeing today of huge technological innovation on genetical engineering foods, um, especially proteins, which is starting to grow, which will at some point compete with what comes from the fields, from the agricultural sector. So that's why we call it agri-food system, because there is a part which is not for food, but creates income for farmers to be able to pay for it. And there is the rest, which is food, of which a little piece goes out even of the agricultural sector. So the agri-food system is a very complex system. It interrelates with health, interrelates with zoonotic diseases. So there is a lot of things that we need to take into consideration. But what we need to be clear is that we need to have one target. And our objective function is to achieve SDG2, zero hunger. We don't want a perfect world without people. We want a, people, a world with people that can eat healthy, that can have access to healthy diets, but we are affecting the least possible our environment. So essentially how we can achieve that SDG2 goal and SDG1 and 10, minimizing the cost and the externalities, the effects, what we call the trade-off to the environment, greenhouse gas emission, misuse of our soil, misuse of our water, how we can change that so that we can achieve that goal. So that, that's the challenge. And that's where you come and where you play a role too. And it's not that I'm going to blame the youth. No, you have to solve them with the old, that create all this mess, don't do nothing. It's, that's not the idea. The idea is that we, the old, are sometimes think linearly. We don't think non-linearly. And, and the challenges that we are facing are non-linear or more than three dimensions. And that's where we need imagination. That's where we need your efforts. That's where you need the, the different way of thinking. Ideas out of the box that can solve problems. We need to open our minds and, and see what else can be done, taking it from another site and look at the problem in a different lens. And that's where we believe that, that you youth can help enormously because you sometimes look at things in a completely different way in which we look at them. You question things 
uh, in a different way in which I question. I, I remember that the most difficult talk I have to give in my life was a talk to 13 year old kids because they questioned everything I was saying on economic issues. And, and it was so difficult for me to, to answer to them and to be able to, at least me, be satisfied that, that they were understanding something that I was saying. But, but that, that, that is the challenge. And that's where you learn uh, how different views and how different vision of things could completely change the way we think. So there is a big challenge there for you uh, and a challenge that we hope uh, through the World Food Forum, uh, we, we can create. We want to create this enormous movement uh, of youth to create this change. And, and, and there are teams working very hard. And, and I again ask, please join this movement. We want to really create a change. And we believe that working together, the youth, the old, the even older, uh, and middle-aged people, we, we can make a difference. We need all this heterogeneity of lenses uh, that normally we don't complement to each other. So let me let me say and let me end uh, by saying that I hope that our com conversations will inspire many to work on innovative solutions to achieve a better production, a better nutrition, a better environment, and a better life, and leave no one behind. It's really important that we take advantage uh, of what we have and the opportunity we have with COVID-19, which we all have suffered so much, uh, to be able to see that we have to look at things differently and we have to create a challenge and we have to resolve that challenge. And that's why the transformative research challenge, challenge that, that we are building with the WFF is an open call for researchers and aspiring researchers who want to create a, a better food future. So let's work in this better food future or this better agri food future uh, so that all are happy and, and at least everybody has access to healthy diets. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Maximo Torero, for such an insightful and inspiring speech. Thank you for sharing your views on how youth has to play a crucial role through science to transform our agri-food system. Your presence and support really makes a difference and inspire us to take part and be part of the solution. So I take this opportunity to personally thank you for your leadership as the chair of the World Food Forum Advisory Committee uh, thank you for empowering youth and inspiring us to take action and create a better food or agri-food future. And now let's move on to the introduction of our talented panel. So let me see if my team, yeah, perfect. They are showing it on the screen. We will start with uh, first three young scientists from CGIR that will then be followed by two science, young scientists from A5. So starting with CGIR, CGIR is a global research partnership for a food secure future that is dedicated to reducing poverty, enhancing, enhancing food and nutrition security, and improving natural resources and ecosystem services. Its research is carried out by 12 CGIR centers in close collaboration with hundreds of partners. Our first two young scientists are from CGIR Center, headquartered in Nigeria the International Institute of Tropical Agriculture. We will first start with Aline Mugisho. Aline is the executive manager for the innovation, Innovative Youth in Agricultural Projects. Before joining this institute, she worked as a senior project manager for the European Youth Education Center in Germany, where she's also completing her doctoral studies at the Billy Brandt School of Public Policy, University of Erfurt. I feel you, Aline, I'm also completing my doctoral studies and it is quite a journey. So without further ado, Aline, the floor is yours. Thank you very much um, to all the panels. Thank you very much for the wonderful presentation. And um, thank you so much as well, Maximo, for pointing out those key issues that we are actually in need of seriously addressing before we get to a point where our communities will be actually dying. We are seeing already a lot of issues happening in Yemen, in Africa here, we have seen a lot of um, uh, children that continue to die and the continent continue to produce quite an amount of food. So it's quite important to ask ourselves, are we doing the right thing as scientists? Are we doing the right thing as young people to take charge of the food security system in our communities, in our country, in our continent? And are we able to actually create systems and structures that facilitate 
that process. Um, and I am not sure if it is the time for us to dig deep into those questions, but uh, I am Aline Mogesho as I've been presented and my role here um, is basically to ensure that the youth is doing, is playing its part, it's participating in feeding the continent in ways that can be sustainable and ways that does not allow for waste. Yeah, thank you so much, Carolina. Thank you, Aline. Thank you for opening uh, such powerful questions about the situation of researchers, where you work and around the world. Now, I would like to pass the floor to Dr. Tefa Wilson. Uh, Tefa, as he allowed me to call him, is an agriculture economist at the International Institute of Tropical Agriculture as well. He received his PhD in agricultural economics from Hagenhan University in Stuttgart, Germany in 2015. He also holds a PhD level certification in global food security from the Young Excellence Food School of Food Security Center in Hagenhan University. Prior to joining the Institute, he was a postdoctoral fellow in the International Center for Tropical Agriculture, as well as a visiting scientist and academic assistant at the University of Hagenheim. Tessa, the floor is yours. Um, thank you, everyone. Um, my name is Tessa. I, I am an agricultural economist and working with IIT. I'm based in, in Nairobi, Kenya. Um, I am a researcher um, at IATA, and my research focuses on the intersection of um, development, agriculture, and environmental economics. Uh, I focus on, on those areas with, with a geographical focus of Sub-Saharan Africa, of course. Uh, I focus on those um, research areas because um, uh, improving agricultural productivity in this region plays a significant role. And, and an extremely important role to improve the livelihood of millions of people, including the youth, because um, the youth constitute the major part of the population in most um, uh, countries in Sub-Saharan Africa. So in my research, I use um, both um, field experiments, um, observational data and simulation approach, um, to look into to, to how technical change in agriculture, uh, for example, uh, genetic improvement, um, or climate smart innovations actually contribute to the um, transformation of the agriculture, uh, the agri-food system to, uh, by transformation. I mean, transformation towards healthy, inclusive, resilient, uh, and sustainable uh, uh, food system, as um, Maximo said. Um, Currently, I uh, am conducting research on, on the food security and poverty impacts of um, technical, te technological innovations that uh, are well generated by the CGRAR, which is directly uh, related to the better life, better produ production, better environment component of the four Bs. Uh, and more recently, I have been conducting research on scaling strategies for um, nutrition sensitive um, uh, innovations uh, and food safety innovations, such as Aflasif, uh, which is a biocontrol uh, for aflatoxin, um, uh, which actually is also related to the better nutrition uh, component of the, the, the four piece. Um, currently, in a, in, a, in, a, in a new project, I am working on on how to um, how to scale out a um, a bundle of climate smart innovations, uh, which constitutes uh, climate smart crops, climate smart um, livestock innovations, along with um, um, institutional uh, and policy options, which actually then contributes to the. Um, all of all the dimension of the four four piece. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much, Tespa, and thank you for sharing your passionate research on climate smart agriculture and linking it to FAO for better. Now we will pass the floor to the last uh, guest we have from CGIR. Her name is Luciana. Uh, thank you very much, Luciana Delgado, from being here. Uh, Luciana is a research analyst at the International Food Policy Research Institute and is going to receive her PhD in production, 
Production, Ecology and Resource Conservation from Wageningen University. I know many of you here that are joining today are from Wageningen. Perhaps you can write in the chat. Um, her current research is on how to improve the measurement of food losses. She has directly worked in Latin America, in Africa, and in Asia. And now, Luciana, tell us more about your research, please. Okay, uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, I'm Luciana Delgado, and I'm a research analyst in the International Food Policy Research Institute. As Carolina said, uh, my current research is on how to improve the measurement of food losses and some interventions to reduce it. Uh, and this uh, started around four or five years ago. Uh, as, you may, as you may know, uh, the SDG 12.3 is on food loss and waste, and it looks to reduce uh, by half food loss and waste by 2030. So for that, there has been a lot of effort to try to bring awareness about food losses. And the first effort, as Maximo said, was the idea that there was one third of food loss wasted, which was estimated by FAO. But there has been other efforts by FAO to develop the food loss index and by UNEP to estimate uh, food waste. So now it's important to understand what is meant by food losses and waste. Uh, because the problem that we found in the literature is that uh, many papers use different definitions of, of food losses. Uh, now, uh, what I have done in this research is I try to understand and to decompose uh, for certain commodities and certain countries, what is the size and, and the magnitude of food loss and where in the value chain uh, it occurs. So to achieve this, uh, I try to improve in the methodology of measurement and also have a sampling design that will incorporate uh, all, all the value chain. So for this, we apply uh, this methodology in nine countries and in seven crops. Uh, our methodology also allows us to decompose our results in, in, in the three elements, the producer, the middleman, and the processors. And for, for each of these actors, we develop a different questionnaire with the specificities for the commodity and country. Uh, in this work, we not only measure the level of losses, we also look at, at both quantity and quality losses, and we also identify uh, where in the value chain the losses occur. So what we found is that most of the losses occur at the producer level, and the losses at the middleman and wholesaler level are very small. So this is very important because it will help us to understand how to target uh, interventions of losses. Uh, we also try to identify the major reasons of losses in the different stages at the producer level, so we have this information at pre-harvest, uh, at left in the field, and at post-harvest level. So in summary, uh, the reduction of losses uh, will not only increase food availability and increase productivity of the farmers, it will also assure our natural resources are used more efficiently. So for example, when we produce food, uh, we are using water, land, energy, and labor and capital. And if this food is lost or waste, we are misusing our resources and at the same time, uh, through in the way the emissions that the uh, production generated. So this is a clear trade-off that today we cannot afford. So uh, thank you very much. And as I said, losses will be central not only for SDG 12, also for SDG 2 and the environment and our natural resources. Thank you very much, Luciana, for such a clear presentation on such an important topic. As uh, Maximo Torero explained, uh, we have nearly 700 million people who are hungry and we still have a very important percentage, almost one third of food that is lost and, and, and even more goes to waste. Um, so uh, I think uh, what you're doing is extremely important. We understand that it's very challenging to find the right way to measure it, but this is why we need more youth in science such as yourself to carry out this research. And now I will pass the floor to our two speakers from A5 Alliance. A5 Alliance was born from the need to find solutions to global challenges such as climate change, food security, inclusive economic growth, and political stability. To this end, five top-ranked academic institutions in the domain of agriculture, food, and sustainability joined forces to form this A5 Alliance. Uh, the members are China Agricultural University, Cornell University, University of California Davis, University of Sao Paulo, and Wageningen University and Research. Our two young scientists from A5 will now also introduce their research. First, I would like to uh, welcome Ting Meng. Uh, she is a young faculty member in China Agricultural University's Academy of Global Food Economics and Policy, 
and her current research is on the influence of climate change on agricultural production, sustainable development, oh, sorry, one second, agricultural production, sustainable agricultural technology adoption, and eco-label agri-product marketing and consumption. Uh, Ting Meng, I think uh, it'll be better for you to explain this very interesting research and very important research. Uh, so now I pass the floor to you. Great. Uh, thank you so much for the kind introduce. And uh, this is Ting Meng and from China Agriculture University. Uh, glad to have such a great opportunity to represent A5 aliens to share ideas with global youth. Uh, so here I showed a single picture of my research. So my research is focused on the interface between agricultural economics and resource environmental economics. This is contribute to the sustainability dimension of agri-food system transformation. So in this picture, there are two systems. One is agricultural food system, and the other is the ecosystem or the environment. So these two uh, systems, they uh, influence each other. So let's first look at how the agricultural food system uh, have influence on the environment. Give you some uh, figures first. Uh, like uh, agricultural land covers about 40% of the world land surface. And it's the uh, world largest consumer of water cows. It's also contribute to 30% of the carbon emission. But the current agri-food system is linking and cost to the water deple depletion uh, soil degradation and uh, biodiversity loss, which cannot sustain. But on the other side, uh, from the environment ecosystem to the agri-food um, system, because of the resource reduction and the diversity decrease has the negative impact on agriculture production, but not only production, also including the capability and the stability. So, we must need to transform the agri-food system for better environment, but not only for the environment, but also for ourselves, for the better food security. But the question for all of you here is how? So we need uh, like a different set of tools like technology innovation, management strategy, and also changing people's attitude and behavior. So my research is working on small field. The first one is small farmers technology adoption, especially towards uh, sustainable agriculture technology adoption, including uh, like uh, organic fertilizer use and also livestock manure recycling. That's the first one. And the second one, I'm also working on the consumers attitude, preferences, and willingness to pay towards eco-labor agri-food products. Um, to look at um, whether they want to pay higher price for the better quality agri-food. So in this uh, Pacific field, uh, which is a multi-dimension and also across different discipline, it's calling for uh, use all across the world to join us to transform our agricultural food system for a better environment. That's it. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ting Meng, for such a clear explanation and for sharing more on the better environment dimension of your research and the importance of behavioral change and behavioral insights to achieve this transformation. I will now like to pass the floor to Matthias Hess from University of California, Davis. The overall goal of his research program is together with his team to elucidate how microbial communities and their individual components affect their environment, which could be human or animal host, and how they re respond to environmental changes. But I now let Matthias explain it and its links with the four betters. Over to you, Matthias. First of all, thank you for inviting me to uh, participate in this panel. I'm actually really honored to be called a young scientist. I think I'm more young, young by mind or still in mind. So youngish scientists might be better. But so I'm really excited to, uh, to talk to you guys today. Um, 
And so, uh, as Carolina said, I'm really taking a whole systems approach and I'm focusing um, mostly on, or my focus of, or the research focus is on microbes and how microbes and their enzymes really can affect uh, food production systems. So we, we work on a couple of different aspects in that area. So one that is of interest here to that, you know, um, list of attendees would be um, how we can reduce methane emission from, from cattle, for example, that would be uh, one aspect that we're working on. Um, we also are really interested in understanding how um, different food production systems um, might facilitate the spread, emergence and spread of um, antibiotics and antibiotic resistance in the, in the environment. And so all of these um, areas that I just mentioned as, as examples that we're working on really elucidate really how microbes really have a, a huge effect, um, not only on food production, but also on the ecosystem. So we try to kind of um, link all these different aspects together. And so you can see how um, really understanding how microbes work together with other microbes or with plants or with the soil or with animals that they interact with, how that can really have a huge impact on food productivity, but also on nutritional values. Um, but then down the road, it also uh, you know affects um, individual farmers on you know more, the more productive they can be, the the, the more um, financial gain they can have from the products that they sell and bring to market. Uh, and you know, last but not least, it really has an impact on the greater environment, and then again on on you know on the global aspect on the impact that individual farmers, but then also larger communities um, have on the world. Um, yeah, with that, um, I just pass it back to you, Carolina. Thank you very much, Matthias. You sure explained it more clearly than I did. Thank you so much, and thank you all of the panelists for making these scientific research subjects so clear for the broad audience that we have here today. We have now reached the third part of today's event, which is a panel discussion between today's guest speakers. I see there have been some questions coming to the chat box. I remind you all to vote for your favorite questions, giving a thumbs up to the ones you like most, adding your questions as uh, we will be selecting the most voted ones. And now I would like to open the floor to all panelists with one question. Uh, you know, there are provisions, projections that global population will reach 10 billion by 2050. And it is not unreasonable to ask, how are we going to feed all these people? Or after the conversation, perhaps make sure that the food reaches all of these people. So the question is open and I let the panel respond. Thank you, Carolina. Um, this is an interesting question. Are we able to feed the, the, the future? And allow me to go a little bit um, toward the direction of uh, uh, the involvement of the youth. The youth population is strongly growing and we know that the youth has a strong role to play um, in, in feeding the, the, the continent, in feeding the world. And the question really, I'm gonna ask, I'm gonna answer a question by asking another question. The question that the CG um, has been asking for a while, what is the important role that the youth can play in, in feeding um, uh, the world today? And we came to understand through the experiences that we've had that the youth is often usually at the consumer side and not necessarily at the producer side. And that is linked to a number of factors. Um, they are not mostly uh, given the choice to consider agriculture as a research opportunity due to, due to limitations of, um, of, aspect, of work, uh, the, the limitation of information that is disseminated to their ends. And that's the first thing that, for instance, at IITA we are addressing providing the right information to the youth, changing their perception and really making sure that they have access to that information that provide them with a platform to evolve within the agricultural sector. The second aspect of it is really how much aware are they of the importance of food security and how do they bring in their knowledge and participation. And to that level, there is a need for training. There is a need for empowerment, but there is a need to understand the market. 
I'm not going to talk more about the market because I'm sure uh, TESFA would address that level. But I'm trying to understand what is the gap, really. Recently, our question has been on where is the gap? Where is the gap for the youth to intervene within the food system? And those gaps, are they linked to market? Are they linked to research? Are they linked to, um, to media, to, to awareness? Are they linked to outreach? Are we understanding the role that can be played from that very much bottom up to also um, the top down approach? How, how, how is that role being connected and coordinated in such a way that the youth um, their power, their knowledge can be capitalized upon to be able to provide the, 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 the continent and also the rest of the world with enough food. So we have decided to bring in the youth in agriculture as our youth agripreneurs so that the youth can understand that agriculture is a business opportunity and they can be able to access those areas, enter those entry points, the food waste, why is the food wasting? It's because nobody is stepping into that as a business opportunity. In many places in Africa, people are more used to fresh food. Frozen food is not something that people are used to be um, to, to, to buying, and they don't understand that it can still be nutritious even if it's frozen. And so we are using this as an opportunity to open a new market niche for the youth to be able to tap into those opportunities, to tap into those, um, uh, that environment where they can start to understand their role, not only in production, but also in post-production activities, in value chain, in research, and in value addition activities. So those are the, some of the aspects that at IITA we are trying to address by bringing in a different model, a model of uh, agribusiness hubs, and model of um, marketing, a model of food system that really builds on training, you know, knowledge sharing and productivity and entrepreneurship. So those are some of just as an intro, that's something that I would like to say. And we do that in different projects. We approach it in different ways. We even have a program that looks at that from a very young them start them early program that is stepping into schools to ensure that even they as young as you are in primary and secondary school, you can still contribute to the food production. And that is an important role that we are, um, we are trying to bring in the youth and ensure that at least every child understand that's importance of production. They will eventually understand the importance of consuming wisely. I'm gonna let it there and yeah. Thank you, Aline, for such a complete answer. Uh, yeah, you're right. Uh, in many places of the world, we're not used to, to frozen food, and, and this is a great business opportunity. What I'm going to do now, because we really want to hear from all of you, is we have some prepared questions from each and every one of you. If uh, during your questions, you still want to comment on uh, the, this first question I just asked, feel free to do so. And I am going to start with a question for Ethel's chief, eco chief economist. Uh, Maximo, this question is because we want to get to know you a bit better, also uh, at a personal and, you know, the scientific mind that you have. So if you were given the chance to go back in time and be a younger research researcher, but you could keep your acquired knowledge and experience, what would your research be about? Okay, that's a complex question. Um, I think that um, if I don't go into, into science issues and I keep working on socioeconomic issues, one of the things I, I will have, which I still want to do, is to see how we can resolve the governance failure and the, the, the governance failure, that the coordination failure that we observe every day. What I am trying to say, um, one of the major problems we see is the lack of, of, of coordination of policies between governments and aligning them to the needs of the farmers or, or the people in the field. Normally, uh, what happens is that policies are, pro, are, are given, but there is not too much uh, of, of coordination of what is really needed. And even within ministries, is, there is very little coordination. And what we are observing in the, in the food systems is that <clears throat> It's not a one sector issue, it's a multidimensional problem that has to be resolved by all the sectors. So we have to be involved with health, we have to be involved with infrastructure, we have to be involved with the trade sector. Uh, even culture, uh, 
culture and food are pretty tied to each other. So that uh, that way of looking at things uh, is something uh, that I have not been able to do. Uh, and a, a clear example of that is how indigenous people look at, at environment and how they look at a thing. So in, indigenous people, in difference to pure science, which will specialize and will go into one sector, they are more holistic. They, they are looking at the whole thing. And within that uh, multidimensionality, they try to find solutions. Uh, like when you go to the potato park, for example, you will see in Peru, you will see how they have been testing different varieties of potatoes in different agroecological climates. Not in a scientific specific sense. So they are not controlling all the variables, but they are taking the package and the complementarities of all the variables and trying to see the changes. So if we combine that with the science approach, it could be extremely powerful. Uh, and it's something that that it has not been done uh, really. And normally we separate them and, and we don't learn from what they did and and trying to 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 find a more systematic way to to resolve problems. So so that that combination of behavioral science and and understanding the technology uh, and bringing the pieces together uh, is something that I would like. So that could mean that I have to go and do again another career and learn a lot about chemistry or biology or soil uh, and then try to see how it complements with what I do today but but that's the way I see it so it, it, because really we talk about systems but we are not doing too much systems uh, indigenous people are doing systems now how we can learn with them and bring the science I think that's the way uh, to move forward so that that will be my my way of thinking going backwards and um, so I will apply again to universities and see if I can do something thank you Thank you very much. This is an amazing answer. So a holistic perspective to every food system. Thank you. Um, I now have a question from Tess, two addressed to TESPA. Uh, so your research interests cover a wide range of rural economic issues. How do you think youth can advance knowledge in this area? Yeah, um, yeah. Thank you. Um, just to, to add a few points on, 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 on Elaine's point about the, how can we feed um, 10 billion people? Um, I think this is a challenge we, we, we have already faced this kind of challenge before uh, and we have managed it. Um, the way we managed it is through a combination of uh, technological innovations and also um, uh, kind of like soft uh, policy and institutional arrangements. So um, for me, I would say um, I'm a bit, uh, very optimistic in a way. Um, we can feed the, the 10 billion people. But then the question is um, not only feed, can we create or build a healthy, inclusive, and resilient and sustainable food system that could feed 10 billion people? That is um, more challenging uh, because as um, uh, Maximo said, currently the, the, the problem is not really production. It's an efficiency problem that we have in the food system because there is enough production to feed the, uh, the, the world population. So if even if you look at um, look into the food security, the food um, insecurity problems of the world today, we have the problem of hunger, obesity, and food loss at the same time. So, um, so it's a matter of uh, optimizing this efficiency along the food value chain and make it more easy to, 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 through, through um, science and innovation and also through uh, formulating smart policy choices that actually shape the uh, choices, the food choices of uh, people in, in the future that could provide mar market opportunities for better and healthy food, food diets um, in the uh, food system. Um, regarding the, 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 the question of um, why is this relevant for, 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 for the youth, um, I would think that there are four main reasons why this is really critical and important for the youth. First, um, the majority of the youth as of now, directly or indirectly depend on agriculture 
in particular, but in more broadly in the agri-food system. So um, uh, involvement in the agri-food system for the use is of course an, an important uh, consideration. Um, it's also uh, from a societal point of view, it, uh, food system transformation is also a, a, an issue of inclusive and equality, right? So it is a, a question of food system transformation for whom? Is the older generation transforming food system for, for the use or would the use be involved in the food, trans, uh, food uh, system transformation process right now to actually uh, um, control the distribution of the benefits, the risks and the costs that comes within the uh, food system uh, in, in the future. That, that is an important area for the use. So it, it, it is really interesting for them to be involved. And, uh, and the, the third option is um, the agriculture food value chain is an attractive proposition for the, for the use because um, Agri-food system is much broader than primary production, right? So um, I, 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 was, I was actually looking into the current evidence from, from um, the Barrett group at Cornell that, that, that they documented um, actually um, the primary production part constitutes only 27% of the, the uh, consumer's expenditure on food. So 72% of the, uh, the additions are actually occurring after farm yet. So uh, uh, these are actually attractive jobs, attractive opportunities for the use, and this would create job opportunities for the use. But then the question is, how could they how could they be involved in a way that they could actually contribute in the uh, uh, Industrial reorganization of the agri food uh, value chain uh, process that would be, for example, in terms of uh, um, new ways of production, new ways of consumption, new ways of uh, uh, marketing, and new ways of um, recycling, even changing food waste into uh, something important, uh, for example, through the bio circular economy concept. And finally, I want to, I want to, I want to emphasize one thing. Um, if we ask ourselves 20 years ago, the kind of jobs we would be working, nobody would actually predict the kind of jobs that the youth are currently uh, engaged in. So the, I, I believe that in the future, even within the agri-food system, with science and technology, technological innovation and institutional innovations, there will be future jobs that we are not aware of right now that will be created as part of the uh, opportunity that's created by the food system. And we, do, we, we are not even capable of envisaging that this kind of jobs will be created in, in, in the future. So, um, so, the, so the use are important because without the use, then these opportunities, we would be able to really uh, envisage them. So, so I say that the, the use are, are, are important in this transformation Thank you. process. Thank you so much, Kesra, for such a complete answer. And I'm sorry to cut you off a bit in the last word, just because we really have so many questions from the audience and we want to make sure to answer all of them. I will ask the last prepared question to Luciana, and then I, I know uh, Ting Meng could answer some one of the, the ones that was asked by the audience. So Luciana, in under a minute, could you tell us the effects of the pandemic in food losses? Uh, yes, so for example, in the case of the produce that is left in the field, um, we expect to, to have more of that because what is happening today is that there will be a, a recession. So that will reduce the demand for the products which are, are already planted. And as a result, farmers will even prefer not to harvest the product because the price uh, that they will get in the local market will be too low and that will increase significantly the, the quantity of left in the field. So that would be the, the, maybe the effect of COVID-19 in, in food losses. It is something that we have already seen. Yes. In the world. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you so Thank much. You. Less than a minute. <laughs>
<laughs> You're great. I need, I need that attitude, please. <laughs> I'm kidding. So Ting Meng, if you, uh, we have one question. It has been the most voted question. And I know you mentioned marketing and the willingness of consumers to pay more for high quality products. The question is, how in a real world and market low price driven of food commodities, new production systems that are sustainable and regenerative could compete and contribute to food security and food safety without subsidies. As there is no free lunch and major agribusiness do not pay premium prices. You, ca you can read it in the question and answers if you want to maybe take a, take a second look. Okay, um, I think, uh, thank you so much for the question about the consumer side. Uh, so first I will give you a number. According to our research across China, that we look at the uh, consumer willingness to pay uh, for green food. So it's lower than uh, organic food, it's about 20%. Uh, so. Uh, consumer willing to pay 20% higher price for um, uh, every food, uh, use less uh, fertilizer and less pesticide and being good for all you, uh, soil you, sorry. And, and that's number one. And number two, we also conduct research on um, the actual market price premium, which we look at the, um, uh, from the online shopping for the agri-food uh, price, the no uh, price and the track their premium. And we found uh, about 20, uh, 10 to 50% of the actual premium. And we also conduct research to ask a consumer why you're willing to pay high, but you actually the uh, market is just say like lower and consumer in China just give us some uh, answers is they are still concerned about um, uh, whether the uh, eco labor is uh, more reliable and also the firm their uh, um, certification is reliable or something about that. That's number one. And number two, I think uh, the question also about subsidy that is one of our pro, um, uh, project focus you know uh, as for the environment we want to uh, not the trade-off between food security and the environment but not the win-win uh, situation from the and the food system so the farmers are the key stakeholders in this market. So uh, we want to increase their awareness and change their behavior. But like uh, also the question asked because of the uh, actuality, uh, the uh, farmers should not pay the whole price or the gap, close the gap themselves. So we should provide the subsidy uh, on one hand, but on the other is the uh, only providing the subsidy cannot promote the market and the industry uh, sustainable, uh, have pursued the sustainable development. So that's why um, globally we have the eco labored product, try to give price signal, uh, like there's a good quality. So whether it can have a good, uh, which can motivate farmer uh, have the more, and sustainable production. Thank you very um, much. That's, that's my answer. Thank you. Thank you very much. And I know Matthias wanted to follow up on this one, so I'll give you the floor. So I, I think I want to follow up on, on the first question, but then also really on this bigger question on how do we actually feed all you know all these people? And I think what we need to do um, as sis is speaking from this really privileged you know point of view where living in an area or in a society where I actually have access to all the food I need um, I think what will be important is to kind of convey uh, to people who actually have enough food why why we need to actually really have a special effort to really distribute the food to people who don't have it you know I think a lot of the people who are here on this uh, uh, workshop right now or the webinar, uh, you know, uh, they are at least um, aware of that problem. But the, 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 the issue at hand is that many of us don't see it. 
Uh, and so it, it really will be important that people living in an area where they have actually access to food understand how it will impact them directly if they actually share their wealth with other people who don't have that. So I think really making sure to, to understand, for everyone to understand how this impact, how everyone um, benefits from equality and food access is really important. Um, unfortunately, I think humans are a little bit selfish. And so I think understanding how this really impacts everyone, um, him or herself is really important. Thank you very much, Matthias. Well, uh, this has been so far such a great session. There are still many questions that uh, unfortunately we run out of, out of time, but we will be answering them. And if you follow us on social media and subscribe to our newsletter, you will be uh, seeing the answers of the panelists to these questions. So I hope everyone got inspired in this session. I know I did. And you're ready to take action and submit your concept note to the World Food Forum Transformative Research Challenge. You will now see a poll question on your screen asking if you already have a research question. Uh, please go ahead and answer because we really want to know. And uh, as Maximo said, the TRC is a call for applications for, from youthful researchers around the world who want to transform agri-food systems through science. You have until June 27th to submit your concept note. So uh, let me see if we can see the answers to the poll. How many of you already have a, an idea? If you could please. Wow, 57%. We can't wait to read them all. And yeah, I, we will leave you with a short video about the TRC. But before that, we sincerely hope that you will take part on this challenge. And as Maximo said, join the movement. Uh, meet other innovators such as yourself who share the same mission to transform our agri-food system for better production, better nutrition, better environment, and a better lab life, leaving no one behind. Thank you to our panelists. Thank you so much, Maximo Todero, for making the time. Thank you, Ting Meng, Aline, Luciana, Tespa. Thank you, Matias. Thank you to our partners, CGIR, A5, FAO and of course One Planet Solutions who has been giving a great hand in this challenge and thank you all of the technical team that has been answering here in the chat and we hope to read your concept notes very soon. Leave you with the video. Thank you so much and have a beautiful afternoon day. We will be waiting for your concept note.